It was nearly 10 years ago as we excavated the ruins of the Jin Shu Temple that we uncovered the silver box which would eventually lead to the writing of the documents of which you are currently listening to the recording of. At first glance, the box seemed smooth and unadorned, but on closer examination, it became apparent that its entire surface was inlaid with a fine network of barely visible symbols. The symbols which I and my comrades soon identified as the letters of the ancient alphabet used by the monks of the Jin Shun faith would prove to be the first clue in a mystery which would span many years of our collected lives. The translation of the Jin Shun box would prove to be an event of epic proportions, not only professionally, but also a life-changing emotional and spiritual experience. Months later, as I and my three fellow archaeologists sat before the pages of the transcribed document, we began to read. What we learned was as chilling as it was revelatory. Over the years, as we had studied the lost culture of the Verzon Empire, one name had arose time and time again. A hero, a philosopher, and a spiritual leader who had been instrumental in shaping the society of this enigmatic people. Everywhere we had excavated, we had found inscribed the name of Elon Joy, also known as the Ghost Dancer and the Knight of the Three Rings, a monk who had become a general that eventually would conquer half of the ancient world before his mysterious death. Contained within the symbols on the silver box was the tale of his marriage and the tragic circumstances leading to his legendary curse. I will attempt the telling of the story with as little embellishment as possible, but I warn the reader that the culture of this ancient people was greatly alien to many of our morals and accepted standards. Their world was not our own, and their reality as detached as if it were another universe altogether. The title of the legend is as was found on the box. It is called The Heart of Elon Joy. <clears throat> In the month of September, several great armies had gathered around the noble house of the wealthy landowner, Jaume Lung Kin. A conflict had issued concerning rights of marriage between several local lords to his daughter, Abonai. Lu Kin had, over many years of negotiation and consolidation of land, promised the hand of his single daughter to at least three different lords. To add to the difficulty of this already volatile situation, it had also become apparent that the young woman was living beneath the yoke of some horrible and possibly supernatural condition. There were rumors of the local peasantry whispering of a possession. It would be the actions of the girl's handmaiden, Danella, sending doves with notes to the Jain Shun, which would bring a lone stranger dressed entirely in robes of black, riding slowly through the encampments of the assembled armies in the early hours of dawn. Shouts called out as soldiers leapt to their feet in surprise at how anyone had breached the line of their defenses, yet none dared attack the stranger, so powerful was the aura of mystical power which surrounded him. Many stood nervously, gripping their swords, but no one would raise a weapon as the shadowy figure passed. Only a single, arrogant young lord descended from the house of the Jia Shen, strode forward and stood wailing angrily at his guards and demanding to know the identity of the rider. His soldiers faltering behind him, he watched as the stranger raised his head and revealed a face half covered in black silk and cloth. One shining blue eye beheld the noble, and for that instant he was frozen by the gaze. As the rider continued forward, the lord trembled and fell back as the stranger passed. The handmaiden, Danella, had awaited the rider's arrival for weeks. Upon receiving word he was arriving, she threw open the doors of the great stilted longhouse and called out in happiness to the man riding closer from the crowded camps. The father of Adonai strode forward from a drunken sleep and had grabbed the woman by her hair with the intention to beat her severely when he halted at the sight of the rider and whispered hoarsely, What have you done, stupid woman? Her reply saved your daughter. Who is this? 
The wretched man shouted as the rider stepped before the stone stairs of the entranceway, bathed in the early morning light. He is the ghost dancer, the sword exorcist, Elon Joy. The woman railed furious after many months of silent acceptance beneath the man's stubborn ignorance. Only he may rid her of her curse. What madness! You are dim with the superstitions of the ridiculous Shane Shu. The spirit has blinded you, old man, Danella cried in rage as she stood defiantly before the Lord. You cannot see the shadow which has fallen over your house. Stand aside and let him enter. Lord Lukin shoved the handmaiden down and moved to confront the rider when he too was caught by the gaze of Elon Joy's one visible eye, and he listened to shivering as if stricken with fever as the stranger spoke in a voice low and melodic. You will not prohibit my entrance into this house. The marks of corruption and shame stain every timber of this dwelling like pus dripping from the boils of a plague victim. Your house, your family, and your very existence are infected with great evil, and I'm here to draw this poison out. Stand aside. The rider dismounted and moved up the stairs as Liu Qin backed away in terror. The gathered armies now all stood in amazement, watching as the dark rider entered the house. Eron stood silent in the doorway as he gazed down into the great hall and saw a bleak and ruined household. Flies swarmed over spoiled food as webs were woven by huge arachnids over every grim corner. Cloth had been draped over every window to secure the stricken girl against the light of day, which brought her such great pain as to make her writhe in pain. At the end of the hall lay a great bed canopied in dark blankets as to shield her from light and sound in a soft cocoon. Elon reached to his face and pulling aside the soft covering over the left side of his visage, revealed the pale milky white orb beneath. Born blind in this eye, it prohibited him only from seeing the world as perceived by most mortals. Its vision was one of a peculiar and morbid gift, allowing him to gaze into the world of spirits and see the dead. What he saw in the home of Lord Lukin shocked even him. Everywhere Elon looked, within the long hall, laid a thick, murky cloud of amassed spirit forms, swirling like smoke within. The faces and shapes of hundreds of weeping enslaved spirits moved like languid oil, floating in dark stained water, and their epicenter was the covered bed of Adam. Striding forward, he threw down his cloak and stepped upon it as raised his hand and called out to the darkness in the tongue of the ancient Shane Shun prayers. Immediately the air became charged with the pulse of electric energy as the shrouds were blown from the windows and warm morning light invaded the nearly impenetrable gloom. A scream echoed from the far bed as Elon withdrew the two long gleaming sabers from his shoulders and held them glowing and still in his thin hands. Moving forward and slowly sweeping the blades through the cloud of dead, he watched as the spirits' horrified faces melted into purgatory and fell back. Gracefully turning and whirling, he began the dance of exorcism. Those spirits strong enough to resist the first onslaught of energy projected by the prayer were met with the burning slash of Elon's blades as they cut relentlessly through the collected mist. Almost floating now, he continued down the hall as the lost souls were swept away, and at last he stood before the bed. With a single silent whisper, be free, he began cutting the blankets aside as the girl within twisted and contorted in agony. The blades glided through the cloth until she lay exposed to the ever brighter rays of the September morning sun shining through the windows. Soon her torment subsided and she lay panting and unconscious as Elon gazed down upon her beauty and felt the greatest sorrow and sympathy enwrap his being at the sight of such an innocent and tortured soul. Then from the darkest remaining shadow, crouched in the corner by the bed, he heard a voice. She 
is mine, the voice sighed. You cannot have her. No one can. Elon peered into the shadow and saw a form composed of what appeared to be ebony ice, watching him with crystalline, shining eyes. Its essence was darkness and freezing cold, and its shape that of a young man. My claim on her is valid. She may not be taken. The being's tone was solemn and calm. It spoke as any would of their property. You cannot harm me with your weapons, and your prayers will fail. I have every right to this one. Elon stared at the being and felt deeply that what it was saying was no lie. Somehow this creature had come into ownership of the young girl's very self, and morbid grief gripped him as he realized just how this may have come to pass. Is there nothing I can do? No way I may free her from you. So you wish to negotiate her with me? It laughed a quiet, terrible sound. She called to me. Is this no indication of what I am? That was so stricken was she with grief that she reached across the void and summoned me to her. But she is so young, Elon the voice wavered as his sword lowered to his side. He stared at this demon with new comprehension. It would take years for one such as you to form. And so it did, Knight. I grew for long years in the womb of despair, just as I was cast from the womb of maternal love. Cold was my conception, and so in this image I grew into a thing of ice. You want to negotiate, exorcist? Then offer me a life. Offer me a chance to live. How? To one such as I, your loneliness is like a beacon night. I see the longing in your eyes when you look upon her beauty. You have already given her a piece of your heart. Now give me the rest. I cannot. I will not give myself to one such as you. Then watch as I turn her existence into a frozen wasteland. Elon looked down once again at the girl, stricken and tormented by the demon soul which had been spawned from the spark of life which had been torn away from her by her father and handmaiden abortionist. I will not let that be, he whispered. What Elon chose to do at this point is not described in any great detail, but the events unfolding afterward were whispered of even before the finding of the box. Elon appeared at the door of Lord Lukin's estate with the Adonai at his side, the blades of his swords dripping with the blood of both Lukin and the handmaiden Danella. As the leaders of the encamped armies approached, they were stricken by waves of cold, powerful magic as they gazed into the exposed eye of Elon Joy, an eye which had turned from milky white to a frightening crystalline black. The story told on the silver box occurs with the history that at this point the leaders bowed and swore an oath of service to Elon. It would be with the force of this now single united army that Elon would sweep across the civilized world, conquering everything in his path. Adonai became his bride, and with her he fathered a dynasty which would last centuries. But legends of his cruel and horrifying rule would last in the words of the legends for all time. In the darkest days nearing the end of his reign, Elon would watch as Adonai succumbed to a sickness of which no healer could comfort. It is written on the box of silver that at her death he climbed to the highest altar of the Shain Shun temple and with a dagger forged by the monks themselves committed himself to the ritual known as Yaizu, which translates roughly into self-crucifixion, the only means by which his soul could be redeemed. Little is known of the details of this ritual except that Elon cut his own living heart from his body and placed it inside a silver box. The silver box we now held in our possession. In the months following the translation, the box was examined and scanned by numerous technicians from across the world. 
I was determined that miraculously it appeared that it did in fact contain what once had been a living organ, a human heart. However, as astonishing and unbelievable as the results of the data illustrated, it was proven consistently that the organ was intact and remained perfectly preserved at minus nine degrees Fahrenheit. Research reveals no technical means by which the box should be able to maintain such a constant low temperature inside. It is my belief that the heart itself is forever frozen.